20th at 9 a.m. Hope to see you there. Amen? Amen. So as we get started with our sermon for today, um, one thing to know about me that you, you may already know, um, especially if you follow me on Instagram, because that's where a lot of this shows up, is that I'm someone who really loves watching good movies and talking about how good those movies are. It's some of my, some of my, one of my favorite things to do. And one of, the, one of my favorite releases from last year, actually, uh, was The Color Purple, starring Fantasia Barino, Taraji P. Henson, uh, Danielle Brooks. Um, you may have seen it or saw some of the, some of the advertisements for that movie. Um, this is actually the second of two beautiful adaptations of Alice Walker's book by the same name. It's an award-winning book that tells the story of a black woman named Celie who grew up in rural Georgia during the sharecropping era of the early 1900s, and it spans several decades throughout her life, where she's actually showing what it looks like to be resilient and to be empowered in spite of deep relational and even racial trauma. One of my favorite subplots of the movie is Miss Seeley's constant search for her sister Nettie's letters in the mail. If you're not familiar with the movie, there's a scene toward the beginning where, unfortunately, Miss Seeley's abusive husband, Mista, threatens to kill Nettie if she ever were to return to their home just to lay eyes on Miss Seeley and visit her. But despite Mista's threat, Nettie stands in front of Mista, chest puffed out, and, pr and promises to write Miss Seeley every single day. And it's in this moment in the movie that we get one of the most famous lines from that movie, I'll write you every day, nothing but death could keep me from it. One of the first scenes of the movie where Miss Seeley is depicted as an adult, uh, we see Miss Seeley played by R&B singer Fantasia pacing the floor on a cold winter's evening, wondering out loud why she still hasn't received one of the letters from her sister. At this point, she begins singing as she's thinking out loud. So many winters gray and summers blue, another endless day to suffer through. She must be dead as she thinks of her sister. What kind of God are you? She prays to God. The misery of living in an abusive marriage where her husband had cut her off from every good thing in her life and every person who loved her was now being worsened by the fact that Miss Seeley still hadn't received a letter from the one person who she knew still loved her in the world. Now, if you haven't seen the movie, I won't spoil it beyond this point, but the reason why this is one of my favorite subplots in the movie, this, this kind of story of Seeley waiting desperately for her sister's letter, is because it captures one of the most beautiful elements of what it means to be human, the lengths to which we will go to know the hearts and the minds of others, to simply connect with the people around us. In The Color Purple, Miss Seeley waits and hopes diligently, season after season, for her sister's letters. Even when her circumstance shouted at her that there was no longer any reason to hope for some kind of communication from Nettie, Seeley kept coming back over and over again, walking down that same gravel-covered pathway of her home and, and hoping that just this one day, finally, I will receive a letter from my sister so that she would know where Nettie was, what Nettie was up to in the world, and just how much Nettie loved Celie. There are so many ways that we find ourselves feeling some kind of version of what Miss Seeley was feeling. So many ways, big and small, that we find ourselves cut off from someone and hoping for some kind of a way to connect or communicate with them. Maybe it's through the process of getting to know your favorite music artist through their most recent album. Maybe it's beginning to date someone and finding yourself being curious all the time about what they're thinking and what they're doing, or, or perhaps it's getting to know a, a new friend and wanting to know all the ways that you are similar to them and the ways that you're different. Some of us have experienced this while leaving a job interview, 
and replaying every single moment of that interview over and over again in hopes that you can find some clue to whether or not the people who were sitting across from you will actually offer you the job. Or perhaps we felt this as parents, where we're just wishing we could read our child's mind to figure out what is explaining their behavior. All of us in some way or another have experienced this desire to hear from someone else, to receive some kind of communication so that we can connect with them and know what is on their mind. Now typically we can overcome this by someone graciously offering some window into their internal world, by sending us a text message, sending us uh, some kind of message on Instagram, or maybe it's as ancient as receiving a letter from them, somehow, typically, we will receive some kind of indication of what's going on in the mind and heart of someone else. But other times, it takes a little bit work, a little bit more work, and it's not as simple. Today, we're going to start a new sermon series called Reading Scripture. And during the next four weeks, including this one, we will be reminded that the way we read Scripture impacts the way that we receive God's Word and the way that we apply it to our lives. But it's worth saying that all of us are not coming to this sermon series at the same point in our faith in our walk with Jesus. Some of us may feel very seasoned and confident when we approach Scripture. And if that is you, I I celebrate that with you. But some of us, on the other hand, are coming to this sermon series with some wounding around Scripture. Perhaps you have some memories of the ways that Scripture was weaponized against you or someone that you care about. Or perhaps it's just the wounding of wanting to understand Scripture but finding it more confusing than reassuring. If you're in the camp of folks who feel very comfortable when it comes to scripture, I want to encourage you to continue leaning into the sermon series anyway. There may be moments in the series where you feel like it's more of a reminder than something that you're learning that's new and that's okay, but perhaps there's also something for you to take from the sermon series so that you can offer it to someone in your life who isn't at that same point that you're at when it comes to reading scripture. And if you're in the second camp of people who is healing from discomfort or anxiety around scripture, I encourage you to free yourself of any shame because this sermon series is not meant to make you feel like you're not doing Christianity correctly, but it is meant to give you an opportunity to hear something from the Lord that may just decrease your anxiety just enough to try coming to scripture again anew. And so together, regardless of which side of the spectrum that we're gonna be on during the sermon series, we're gonna seek to approach scripture with a greater degree of humility, openness, and curiosity so that we will be further and further shaped into the likeness of Jesus. And so to begin this four-week journey, we'll spend some time studying one of Paul's letters recorded in 2 Timothy, and we'll explore the following main idea, that God's people are called to read scripture with a desperate desire to know the mind of God. I've called today's scripture, Rediscovering the Gifts of Scripture. I invite you to pray with me before we dig in. Lord Jesus, what what a gift it is that you, um, in your wisdom, have come up with this beautiful masterpiece we call the Bible, that we call scripture, and that we will hold it in our hands and be able to read it and and get to know you through it, Lord. I I first just thank you for, for being so gracious and so loving that you would want us to know what kind of God you are. And so, Lord, I pray that um, given however we come to this sermon series, whether it's as someone who's comfortable with reading scripture or someone who's still wrestling with it, Lord, I pray that you, that your spirit would meet us where we are as we hear your word today, Lord, would you have us to receive just the right thing that we need to hear to move our hearts further along in more closeness with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I invite you to join me um, by remaining seated and and reading the the scripture that we have planned for today from the screens. We're going to be reading from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. 
And I'll be reading from the NIV version if you'd like to find it in your Bible apps. Let's read together. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evildoers and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This is the word of the Lord, and the people of God said, thanks be to God. I pray that it would fill our minds, flow from our mouths, and free our hearts to live as the beloved children of God. So here's a little bit of background, some history for what's going on in scripture. Paul is writing from his imprisonment in Rome. We don't know if it's house arrest or if he's in an actual prison, uh, but he's imprisoned again, and he's writing a second letter to his mentee, Timothy. We learn in his first letter to Timothy that he's been sent by Paul to pastor a church in, in the city of Ephesus whose main plight or conundrum at that time was that they had this small group of false teachers who had begun successfully swaying Christians away from the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, some of this strange good news that these false teachers were teaching sounded a little bit like, oh, God doesn't like people who eat meat, or Jesus doesn't actually want you to get married. He wants everyone to stay single. And the people of Ephesus were struggling to figure out if it was this version of the good news that we should live out, or if it's the version that Paul taught before he left the city of Ephesus. Now already, I can imagine that we're beginning to see ourselves a little bit in the scripture, if not ourselves, the world around us. Because if we're honest, this isn't too different from what we see showing up on social media or in conversations around us where people are shouting their versions of what they believe the gospel or the good news to be. And when we listen closely, we find that it's not really good news at all or it just downright doesn't sound like the good news that Jesus brought with him. Now, we've already talked about a couple of examples of the good news that the people of Ephesus were wrestling with, but we also have some examples of today's strange good news. One of them is the idea that we can save ourselves through nothing but self-improvement alone. There's this kind of idea that the good news we have to look forward to is that you can read just enough self-help books and go to just enough counseling sessions to fully heal our souls, the deep parts of us that feel like something's missing. The other version of the good news that we're wrestling with is that the best way to prove how worthy we are is through our race or our class. We're being told the mythology that the only way that you can prove your worth to the people around you is how you look and what you possess. Paul explains in the scripture just before our text for today that the people who believe in these strange versions of good news, they find that they kind of start showing the proof that they're believing in the wrong good news in their behavior. He writes a long list for Timothy of the, of the behaviors that he should look for in the city of Ephesus to kind of test and see if which version of the good news folks were believing. 
Starting in verse 2, Paul says that people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, and the list goes on and on and on. That these will not only be the signs of the last days, but also the signs of the fruit of the wrong kind of good news taking root in someone's heart. But when Paul continues, he continues by reminding Timothy, beginning in verse 10 through 13, that Timothy has seen, on the other hand, the proof of the good news of Jesus in Paul's life. He says in verse 10 that he knows that Timothy has seen Paul's patience, that he's seen his demonstration of love, that he's seen his endurance through suffering and persecution simply for calling Jesus Lord and for preaching the gospel of Jesus. In verses 12 and 13, Paul reminds Timothy that while the false teachers will prove that their strange good news has no real power by going from bad to worse and deceiving to being deceived, people who want to live a life ruled by the good news of Jesus will demonstrate the power of that good news by the way that they overcome and go through suffering and persecution. As I read this part of Paul's text, this letter that he's written to Timothy, I, I can't help but to think of a younger version of myself, the version of myself that was just beginning to make my faith my own. And I remember times when I was praying to the Lord and even venting to friends at that time about how unfair it felt that I was suffering or going through something hard. I became convinced somehow, probably because I was just young, that being a follower of Jesus somehow meant that we don't suffer in the same ways that those who have intentionally turned away from God suffer. But what I hear Paul saying to Timothy and by extension to us as we read this letter today is that following Jesus doesn't necessarily exempt us from suffering and persecution. In fact, there are ways that there will be versions of persecution that we will experience simply because we are saying yes to Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so as we start our sermon series by reading this particular scripture, we find that Paul is capturing two very important points that it'll be important for us to kind of use to fine tune our theology about scripture. And the first point is that the human condition involves constant confusion about what the good news actually is. That what it means to be human means that we will constantly be pulled for, by this version of good news to that version of good news every single day. And secondly, that the human condition involves the reality that no one, not even the folks that we label good people, are exempt from suffering. These are the problems that are a part of every human's reality, regardless of their relationship with Jesus. But thankfully, Paul doesn't just leave us hanging there. That would be a pretty depressing way to end the letter. He continues by actually giving us a solution. Beginning in verse 14, he urges Timothy to continue in what he has learned. Continue in what you have learned from the Holy Scripture since what he says is infancy. And he invites him to use that to help him persevere through the suffering that he was enduring, not only as a young pastor over the city of Ephesus, but also simply as just a human. We see Paul inviting him to think back to his grandmother and his mother, who we find in 1 Timothy raised him in the faith and, and had him get familiar with the stories of the Torah and the scriptures that helped him to understand what kind of being God was. And he said, continue in what you've already been convinced of. And so Paul ends our scripture for today by actually strengthening Timothy's trust in the scriptures that he was already familiar with. Paul strengthens Timothy's trust by compelling him to read scripture and by explaining the nature of scripture. Paul reassures Timothy, Timothy that the way to overcome all the confusion around him and the way to secure his salvation was to continue in what he has learned, to actually lean into the process of reading and studying scripture. 
Now, family, this is where my prophetic imagination begins to overlap a little bit with our scripture for today, because I've read a little bit of the rest of what Paul has written to the other churches that he's pastored, and I imagine that when he wrote this phrase, continue in what you've learned, that Paul wasn't just making a calm suggestion. He wasn't just kind of offering some options, but I imagine that he was hoping that Timothy would actually earnestly continue in what he has learned, that he would passionately and fervently seek out what his grandmother and his mother has already taught him in the scripture so that he for himself would more deeply know God in the face of suffering and persecution. Because Bible scholars tell me that about five years earlier, Paul wrote to that same congregation in the city of Ephesus a passionate prayer describing his hopes for these particular people of God. In Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 through 20, Paul wrote, And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long, how high and deep, is the love of Jesus Christ. Knowing the love of Jesus wasn't something that was just optional to Paul. It was essential. And so when I imagine us taking heed to what Paul told Timothy and continuing in what we have learned, I I imagine us looking a little something like Miss Seeley in The Color Purple. I imagine us walking day after day after day down the gravel-covered pathways of our lives toward our Bibles and hoping upon hope that there is just one word, even if only half a letter from God telling us where God is, what God is up to in the world, and just how much God loves us. But what Paul is saying here is that if we do not open the Scriptures... And if we do not earnestly continue in what we have learned there, that the process of overcoming that suffering and persecution won't be as easy. Paul finishes today's scripture by reassuring Timothy of the nature of scripture. He says, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul reminds Timothy of the gifts of scripture here, that first off, scripture comes from a reputable source. It's not just made up, it is something that he says is God-breathed. And secondly, the the scripture serves a very specific purpose to, to strengthen us in our salvation and to ultimately equip us for every good work. On page 30 of his book, Dr. Edwards, the the gentleman he's going to uh, join us on April 20th for our workshop, he writes in What is the Bible and How Do We Understand It? Even though we know the Bible is a single book, it is actually a collection of writings. The Bible can be thought of as a library, therefore, because it consists of several books put together over a long period of time, and also because different sections of the Bible contain different styles of writing. There is poetry, there are songs, there are books of wisdom, there are prophetic oracles, there are narratives, and there are letters. And the Bible, therefore, because it is written this way, is a collection, but not a random one. And it's because its coherence comes from its primary subject, which is God. The Bible is about God, but also thanks to the grand story of God written about in the Bible as God guides humanity into becoming a a community built on love. So what happens when we read scripture, Dr. Edwards is saying here, is that we are saying to God, I trust that you were intentional in trusting these particular people at this particular point in history, in this particular language, and through this particular cultural lens to tell me, the reader, what you, God, are like. But as with any form of communication, whether it's written or spoken, it's not always simple. It's not always black and white, pun intended but sometimes it's complicated. Sometimes when we open our Bibles, we legitimately feel confused. 
Maybe because we've opened it as a genealogy at the genealogy and we can't pronounce half of the names or, or perhaps it's writing about a custom that just is simply too ancient that it doesn't have any transferable resemblance to something we live today. Whatever it is that might make it confusing, we know that we've experienced a moment like that. And the reality is that the Bible was written thousands of years ago in a language that very few of us speak, whether it's Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic. And so two things are true when it comes to Scripture or the Bible. Just as it is a God-breathed and trustworthy gift to us, it also requires that we read it in community with current and past members of our community, with lay members of our community and trained members of our community so that we can make sure that we're understanding Scripture as closely as possible to the way the Spirit of God intended it. And so secondly, Paul reminds us that Scripture serves a specific purpose, and that is to ultimately equip us for every good work. Now here, Paul helps Timothy maintain focus in his belief about Scripture by helping him understand what it is for. Notice that this Scripture doesn't say that Scripture equips us for um, knowing more about God than the other people around us. Notice, notice that it doesn't say that Scripture equips us for making people feel ashamed about what they don't know about God. But instead, Paul says that it is for righteousness, for strengthening our salvation and for being able to do every good work. This is where it can be helpful to kind of check in with our uh, universal community members who are trained in biblical scholarship because Bi Bible scholar Tim Mackey, who you may be familiar with from the Bible Project, he explains in his commentaries on the word righteousness uh, that people from Jewish heritage thought of the quality of, of being righteous a little bit different than we tend to. In Western culture, we tend to hear the word righteousness and we think of it as kind of an inherent thing about us that's always true. But Tim Mackey actually says that the way that the Jewish folks who lived the scriptures as it was being written, they thought of righteousness as something that was relational, something that had to do with how you treated the people around you. Mackey explains that Jewish people thought of righteousness in terms of two closely linked words, mishpat and tzedakah. Mishpat is a word that loosely translated can talk about making things right. It's often translated into the word justice when we read it in the Old Testament. But tzedakah is often the word that we see translated into righteousness, and that actually means right relating with others. And so when we read scripture, it isn't meant to simply sit on the shelves of our minds for us to, to pull down and impress God or to impress ourselves or to impress others about what we know about God, but it's actually meant to shape us into the way we should look so that we would embody the mindset of Christ. Because we have sung the hymn that says, He is our righteousness. Jesus embodies the very mishpat and tzedakah that the people of, of Israel and the Jewish brothers and sisters who are living the scriptures would have thought about when they read and wrote the word righteousness. In our Covenant Partners class, during the section where we explore what it looks like for us to do discipleship here at Sanctuary Columbus Church, we explore the analogy of putting on Christ based on Romans 13. And we start by asking ourselves the question, what is your favorite piece of clothing that you love to pull out of your closet and wear over and over again? I want to invite you to just think about that. Is it a sweatshirt? Is it a pair of sweatpants that have a few holes in them because you've been wearing them since the 80s? Is it a pair of shoes? What is that piece of clothing? Do you reach for it because it makes you feel comfortable? because it makes you feel safe, because it reminds you of something good and true, or even because it makes you feel attractive, maybe? In our Covenant Partners class, we invite our class members to actually imagine that feeling that motivates you to reach for your favorite piece of clothing over and over again, and imagine that it's that very same feeling that pushes us to put on the mindset of Christ. 
that there's something that we have seen about Christ Jesus when we open up the scriptures and we read about him in the gospels that it makes us say, oh my goodness, I just want to wear him around. I want to wear the character of Jesus because it reminds me of something good and true, because it's comfortable, because it makes me feel safe, or because it makes me look attractive to the rest of the world around me. It's the reading of scripture that actually gets us into this process of being able to put on the mind of Christ because without reading it, we simply would not know who it is that this Jesus looks like. Paul wrote his letter to Timothy during a time when there was confusion about what the good news actually was. And Paul's answer to that problem of the confusion was, Read scripture, Timothy. Continue in what you have learned. Continue in what you have already been convinced in so that you would know what is the true good news of God. And so as I close today, a reasonable question that we can have on our minds at this part of the sermon is, so what? Now that we've spent some time exploring Paul's letter to Timothy, what exactly are we invited to to do as we read Paul's words about Scripture? So I want to offer just a couple of things as some action steps. The first one is very practical. I want to invite you to really consider joining us for that workshop on the 20th. And I, I really assure you that this isn't just another program, but this is really a part of a prayer-motivated vision from our pastoral team for our church to continue to grow in the comfort and confidence that we feel when we approach scripture. Our hope is that when we go to that workshop, we will have some seeds that get planted and watered, and that we will take that with us in a continuing process of learning how to become comfortable and more and more humble readers of scripture. And then our second invitation is I want to invite you to ask yourself, in what practical ways am I going to say yes to Paul's invitation to continue in what I've learned? Now, this is going to look very different depending on which part of that spectrum you're on that we talked about earlier. If you're someone who's already very comfortable with Scripture, perhaps what feels practical for you in saying yes to learning and leaning more into scripture is I'm going to kind of go back to my Bible app and start a new plan for reading scripture. Or maybe it's I'm going to move my Bible to my nightstand now so that it's more easy to get to when I want to read it. Maybe that's the practical step for you. But if you're someone who is struggling with discomfort or anxiety or wounding around scripture, I want to invite you to just stretch yourself just a little bit to get closer back to knowing more deeply the love of Christ through scripture. Maybe that means you just listen to scripture rather than actively reading it in your Bible. Maybe that means you do spiritual practices like the Visio Divina that we did earlier today where you think about the character of God and what it's like for God to interact with humanity by looking at images and meditating on them in prayer. Or maybe you sit with people who you feel safe with And you just read out loud one scripture at a time and you discuss it in a way that feels safe and not overwhelming. Whatever that is for you, I pray that the Lord will reveal to you one practical step that you can take so that you can get closer back into the rhythm of continuing in what you know as revealed in scripture. I invite you to pray with me. Father God, what... What a privilege it is. Privilege doesn't even feel like a big enough word. But what a privilege it is that you would give us the opportunity to know who you are through Scripture. Lord, that you would trust ancient people in ancient languages to tell us their story of what it was like to interact with you so that we would know what your character is like and what your love is like. Lord, I thank you that in your infinite wisdom, you desired that for us and you made a way for it to be possible. And so, Lord, as we sit here in this point in history, I pray that you would meet us where we are. If we're in a place of wounding, Lord, would you meet us with peace and healing, Lord? If we're in a place where we feel comfortable and and empowered about Scripture, Lord, I pray that you would celebrate and sing over us as we prepare the way for people around us to meet us in that same place, wherever it is that we are.
I am confident that by your spirit, you will give us what we need to continue leaning into scripture so that we would learn how to look more and more like Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.